It is raining, not too hard, and the steady drizzle is more, is more an annoyance than a hindrance. It cascades across the otherwise still surface of the boggy water around you and patters an incessant percussion across the wooden floor of the dinghy. It has already begun to pull in the center, though, if it bothers the ferryman. He gives no sign of distress as he guides the small craft along with practiced ease. The only light comes from the small lantern dangling on the forward hook, and even that seems a poor defense against a nigh impenetrable darkness. What little moonlight there is... What little moonlight there is to be had is smothered by, by a thick overhead canopy of knotted branches. The only thing you can see as the ferryman propels the craft silently forward are the trees crowding in around each other, and an occasional glimpse of brick or mortar jutting from the murky depths, long since claimed by the swamp's mossy grasp. Ahead in the distance, another light appears, and, as the ferryman guides you closer, you can make out a figure standing just beside a well of light. A small man, old at a glance, with light wispy hair and leathery weather-beaten features, his slight flame frame is lined with thick canvas robes, and his feet protected by a pair of heavy boots that climb up just short of his knees. As you draw closer, you realize he isn't quite as short as you thought, though still quite small. The docks are completely submerged by at least half a foot, not, if not a little more, and you can barely just make them out beneath the swamp's surface as the ferryman pulls his craft alongside them. The old man waves at you. Player three responds. <laughs> oh, Sorry. Yes, it's, it's Gordon Freeman. Yeah. Sorry, he speaks in a reedy voice. We're knee-deep in the flood seasons here, mostly literally, so the swamp's a bit out of its banks. We learn to make do, but it can be pretty hard on newcomers. If you don't have a pair of good boots, you'll probably want to get set up in the general store tomorrow, but hey, where are my manners? Guess I should introduce myself. Name's Franklin. But everyone here mostly just calls me Frank. Anyways, name's Franklin, and I'm the harbor master. Mostly. He extends a hand and motions for you to join him on the dock. You follow player three as he steps from the dinghy onto the dock. The ferryman tips you a nod and then shoves away before guiding the dinghy back out into the darkness. Franklin begins to lead you away from the dock, the water working around your legs with every step sometimes barely ankle deep, other times near your knees. The outskirts of the town consist of dozens of shoddy wooden buildings thrust up against each other. They rest at odd angles, and it's difficult to tell if it is because of poor construction or if the ground has just shifted due to the flooding. Indeed, the swamp water seems to have found its way into each and every building along the way. There is no one to be seen and no light to travel by, and Franklin leaves you along by lamplight. He continues to speak as he walks. To be honest, I was surprised when I heard you lot were coming. Figured I'd come down to greet you. You didn't exactly pick the best time to pass through, you know. Everyone's been a bit on edge lately, especially since the lights went down. It doesn't help that we're so crowded. Everyone on the outskirts here likes to move in when the floods come. Can't blame them. It's been a hard year, and the rot spread closer than ever. If you have knowledge geography, you may make a knowledge check. All right. Uh, so I have two or three knowledge geographies. Of course, you may always roll geography. Oh, you may always roll knowledge anyways. All right, so... Uh, roll 1d10. For knowledge, you roll 1d10 and add any specific knowledges you have. So tier 3 knowledge for geography, so I roll a d10 and add 3 to that. That's it. All right. So that'd be a 9. 7. Uh, 4. He needs... Player 3 needs dice. Oh, yes, of course. Here you are, player 3. 9. Plus three, so yeah, he wins. All right. Gordon Freeman happens to know a lot about the geography of this area. That's great. Too bad he can't articulate to this. Everyone who got an eight or above, raise your hands. Okay. Nearly everyone. All right. You know that the awakening didn't just affect people and animals. It also affected the, the fauna as well. The rod is a colloquial local term that is used to describe a phenomenon that inhabits the swamp. It appears to be a kind of thick, mossy growth that clings to the base of trees. It slowly wraps and distorts its host, apparently rotting it away from the inside out without killing it. Instead, it takes over, spreads to the roots, and reshapes the tree to suit its needs. The tree becomes like a living body, capable of surprisingly swift mo motions, and, by using its roots, can grow into other creatures, living or dead, and quickly spread through the body, into the limbs, to use it like a puppet. The result is a zombie-like creature that is incredibly difficult to kill without destroying the rod's host. Um... Did anyone get a 10? Got 11. Oh, wow. All right. Uh, in the early days of the New World, it was common practice 
to discard bodies into the growing tributaries and rivers that would eventually become the swamp as the climate continued to shift. The plant life that lives there now grew from a sedimentary of corpses, and many say that is the source of the rot. Would you like to share any of that with your comrades, player three? All right, you all now know a little something about the rot. Player three, super ace player. He's a physicist. He sure happens to know a lot about geography for a physicist. It's very good. With a bar. Anyways, <laughs> you continue following Franklin. Unless anybody would like to break off, no, I'm try not. your luck Do in the we... darkness with the rot. Absolutely not. No. no. I'll continue to follow the man with the light. <laughs> All right. Yes. Good call. What about you, player three? All right. In that case, the ground begins to slope up, and you start to climb out of the muck and bile of the swamp. While it clings to your soles and sloshes around in your boots, the going gets a little easier. Only the ever-present patter of the rain remains to slow you. After a few minutes, a pair of shapes loom from the darkness. The dull shine of copper and steel, the first hint before the two figures take shape. Easily 12 feet tall, with broad, sloped shoulders that sweep up and over an insect-like head. Its posture is stooped and figure malformed thanks to a pair of thick cylindrical arms and powerful barrel-like legs. A pair of smokestacks jut j almost awkwardly from where the base of its neck should be and rumble a barely visible zephyr of smoke into the dreary night sky. Though massive, its body appears to be assembled from a ramshackle collection of metal and alloys. Much of, much of it is rusted and ruined, hastily and sloppily fashioned together with bolts and rivets. Does anyone know anything about mechanics? Mm. I did. Roll it. Everyone roll it empty otherwise. Uh, mechanic is a skill. It's a d12. Roll this. Yeah, one. Natural right, that would, one. That would just be skill. It would be a skill, yeah. yes. Alright, so Seven. I get a d4 and that. What do you get now? Plus five. D6. Okay, so you roll one die. Yeah. There you go. Alright. Natural one. Two, four, <coughs> three. Twelve. Well, it didn't help us much to... Got 12. 12, player 3, you get anything? Same here. Same here? All right. You know that this is a Guardian, which is a clockwork, steam-powered automaton that is incredibly difficult to build and maintain. Towns and cities often clamber over the chance to get a functional model, or even better, one of the master craftsmen capable of their construction and maintenance. They possess incredible strength and are nearly invulnerable to typical arms and munitions though their capabilities can vary wild, wildly based on their age and, more importantly, the skill of the creator. They usually have limited animalistic intelligence based on the spirit of whatever creature was bound to the frame during its creation. You know, just at a glance, that these are probably very old and they're extremely poorly maintained. Mm -hmm. and they probably have lost a large amount of their capabilities. Yeah. But they still look fairly intimidating. He sees you, uh, Franklin sees you looking at him, and he says, Oh, don't mind Leonard and Skinner here. They might not look like much, but they help dissuade the odd bandit raiding party. Behind them, Leonard and Skinner, is a massive wall made primarily of wood that stretches off to the darkness on either side. On the other side, you can make out the muffled sounds of low society, and peeking just over the top, the gentle glow of firelight makes a dent in the night sky. Franklin cups his hands, and he calls up, Gregory! Open up! Got a few new rivals down here. It's not polite leave them standing out in the rain. The other voice answers. Hey, you, Frank? All right, I'm opening it up. After a few seconds, there's a shifting sound. Creak. And then the gates swing open and gentle lamplight floods out to meet you. Franklin glances back at you with a plot smile and says, You should head towards the inn. Should be enough beds to put the lot of you up for the night. Come talk to me tomorrow if you're looking to get underway out into swamps. I'll point you in the right direction, but until then, welcome to New York. You enter the town. The New York outpost is a medium-sized town. It has a general store, an inn, a bar, and an outfitters. It is surrounded by a haphazard construction of ramshackle houses that form the outskirt, which is what you were walking through a moment ago. And the town pro but the pr town proper, unlike the outskirts, well-built and maintained. During the rainy season, the roads are reduced to a muddy mess, and during this time, the townspeople line the main streets with planks and logs to make the going a little easier. On the far side of the settlement is an overlook from which passersby can view, can view the boggy bio that has claimed the bulk of what was once New York. While many of the buildings remain standing, many more have collapsed in and on themselves on their neighbors, creating a disjointed, confusing skyline that rests against the eerie backdrop of the massive retaining wall that separates the ruins from the sea. As you walk through the town, you realize several of the streets are lined with lampposts. That 
While many of them show signs of constant repair, stand strong despite the weather, their base is lined with concrete. Electricity is a rare commodity, and here it seems a little different. If any of them are operational, you can't really tell. All of the light is provided by burning lamps hanging on a makeshift hook beneath the main bulb housing. As you Walt Franklin explains to you, yeah, usually we'd have the whole place lit up on a night like this, but our generators got nicked a few days back. Bit distressing that. No one can say what might have happened. For my money, it was those damn bog witches. They're still in the outskirts sometime. Take a few odds and ends here and there. More nuisance than anything, and they've never made off with anything that we couldn't do without. But it was really only a matter of time before they went too far. Most of us don't have much contact with them, to be honest. But Joe, our old, cour our old courier, see, he used to run a few things out to him sometimes. Poor fellow, we finally had to give up and get a replacement. Got here just last week, actually. Uh, could I ask Franklin exactly what a bog witch is? Seems like an interesting thing. Sure. Would you like to ask him what the bog, uh, what a bog witch is? Uh, yes. Um, the bog witches are a small coven of women who live... He explains that they live several blocks into the ruins of New York, and they're very powerful mages and wizards, and they prefer to keep to themselves. They don't live with a whole lot, and anything that they need, they usually take it from others, mm -hmm. and most of the townspeople live in an abject fear of them, primarily because of their powerful magics. Oh. Powerful magics, you said. Neat. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it's mostly... Um, they don't really make themselves too much of a nuisance. Uh, he says it's mostly a super, uh, superstitious fear that keeps people away from them. Um, he does say when you ask, though, that if you're interested in pursuing it further, the outpost is offering a small reward to anyone who can get back the generators or at least find out what happened to Joe. Is that something you'd be interested in? Uh, how do yes. you feel, party? Sure. Sure. Okay. Quest. Sounds great. Player three's all in. Well, all right. player three's in, I'm in. <laughs> He's the face of the party. Yeah. The ever present rock that keeps you all together. God bless you, player three. <laughs> you are the you best. and your two arms. <laughs> These two freakishly human arms. And I can't. And you can't be seen. I too have two arms. All right. We have um, plenty in common. Well, I mean, if you guys want to go out and look for them, we won't stop you. Um, tell you what, why don't you get settled in tonight, and tomorrow morning meet me down on the bank, and I'll help you get underway. I'll give you a map, point you in the right direction. Sounds good. Yep. All right. All right. Well, I'll see you then. And he begins to dot her away, if anyone has any more questions they'd like to ask him. Player three. <laughs> no, he changed his mind. Anyone else sure? have anything to ask? No more. Uh, yeah, I'll go in this one. Okay, you're all good. Is there anywhere that you would like to go while you were in New York? As I said earlier, there is a general store, an inn, a bar, and an Outfitters. Well, first things first, we should have the Outfitters look fabulous. Then we toss over that bar and see what's happening there. Then we go to the general store. Then we go to the general store. And prepare for the war. And then we <laughs> sleep. Or we wait, rather. All right, um... Sounds like a solid plan. If you go to the Outfitters, or if there's anything you'd like to get, rather, um, everything runs on a single price line. For weapons, it's three times. It's a, it is a red owl cost equal to three times its tier. For accessories like goggles, uh, boots, things like that, it's two times its tier. And for anything that's expendable, like med, uh, med packs or things of that nature, it's one times its tier cost. So you guys all have 15 renown to spend. <laughs> so you could buy pretty much uh, anything right now. If there's anything you're in better weapon, better armor, any kind of items. Can I get more arrows? You could. It would be like one per twenty. One renown per twenty.